Due Process, awarded the 2005 New York Emmy for Societal Concerns Programming. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Sam Alito's gone to Washington, the second Bush justice. But do two new members mean an all new court? The Bush Court, opposing views on this edition of Due Process. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual and online legal reference, elaw.com. So the latest justice has joined the court. There's one less woman, a new chief, and two more conservatives. We now know what this new court looks like. What it will do is not so clear. I'm Raymond Brown, and on this edition of Due Process, two expert court watchers weigh in on whether the new Bush court is cause for despair or celebration. We'll get two very different verdicts from former state Supreme Court Justice Peter Verniero and John Payne, distinguished service professor at Rutgers Law School. But first, Sandy King with a look at the latest Supreme. Raymond, those of us who've worked the federal courts as lawyers or reporters have already had to get used to a man we knew as New Jersey's U.S. attorney as the nation's homeland security chief. And now we'll have to adjust to seeing another familiar face, another of our former U.S. attorneys on the nation's highest court. As U.S. attorney, it was my job to use the the legal resources that were available to address the crime problems of the district. He may still be. Kind of a Jersey guy. But now you can call him. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Mr. Justice Alito. Allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. Sam Alito is this court's newest member, despite some staunch opposition. On the cases he decided. In case after case, we see legal contortions and inconsistent reasoning to bend over backwards to help the powerful. He may think that uh, he helped the little guy, but the record's clear that the average person has a hard time getting a fair shake in Judge Alito's courtroom. And some warnings of doom. Look, Sam Alito may be a scholar and a gentleman, but I think his elevation to the Supreme Court is a constitutional disaster. The eyes are 58, the nays are 42. In the end, the vote came along party lines, with just four Democrats joining the eyes and a single Republican with the nays. But there had been some bipartisan support for the one-time U.S. attorney from New Jersey turned U.S. appellate court judge. I'm just glad that there's a man of that character and capacity and ability who could be on our United States Supreme Court. We handled... Strong support had come from the federal bench. His emphasis on first-rate work, his fundamental <laughs> decency. Even one of its most liberal former members. The extent to which opponents of Judge Alito's confirmation largely ignore his overall 15-year record as a judge suggests, at least to me, that the real target for many of the somewhat vitriolic comments on the nomination is less him than the executive branch administration that nominated him. But the senators from New Jersey were not on board when Bob Menendez stood for his first words from the Senate floor. It was to say no. This is about the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court, alone among our courts, has the power to revisit and reverse its previous decisions. And though Frank Lautenberg weeks before had presented Alito to the Senate. Judge Alito is from my home state. 
and I was honored to introduce him to the Judiciary Committee. The fear of what he would do on abortion was Lautenberg's reason for saying no. For the women who want government's hands off their bodies, for everyday people, I will oppose this nomination. The Alito tally was in sharp contrast to the easy confirmation of John Roberts as Chief Justice, but he was replacing the conservative William Rehnquist, not Sandra Day O'Connor, who's been the essential swing vote on so many key issues. Justice O'Connor has been the deciding vote in key cases protecting individual rights and freedoms on a narrowly divided court. And the stakes in selecting her replacement are high. Mr. President, thank you once again for the confidence that you've shown in me. Their decisions affect the lives of millions of Americans. So it's not where you come from that matters, but where you will take the nation. That the stakes are high may be the one thing both sides agree on. But whether Alito and Roberts are a good bet or a bad one, well, that depends on your point of view. And for two very different points of view, we welcome two expert court observers. With us here in Trenton, Peter Venero, former state attorney general and a former member of the New Jersey Supreme Court, and in Newark, John Payne, a Board of Governors Distinguished Service professor who teaches Supreme Court at Rutgers Law School. Let me start with you, Justice. Um, we've heard, we saw in the package, and we've heard for weeks now, predictions of doom on one side, enormous expectations on the other. Uh, where do you come down on that? Is it all so much hyperbole? I think there is a lot of exaggeration that has permeated the confirmation process in general, uh, and in particular with respect to Justice Alito. I think there is great expectation, but I don't think there's impending doom. I think uh, Sam Alito is widely viewed as being someone who is smart and honest and diligent and fair, and I think those are precisely the qualities we want in a member of the Supreme Court. Professor, what do you say? Do you see uh, reason for predictions of doom? We heard your, your, your fellow professor, Frank Askin, saying this is a constitutional disaster. <laughs> Frank Askin is a hard act to follow. Uh, I, I wouldn't go that far. Predictions are always really tricky in this um, Supreme Court business. Uh, I'm reminded that uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, shortly after appointing um, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes to the court, uh, said he could have appointed a banana that would have had more backbone than, um, than Holmes. So presidents don't, don't always get what they think they're getting, and hazarding a prediction is a, is a tricky business. You're uh, not alarmed? Uh, I'm very alarmed. Um, I was going to say, that said, uh, nobody can doubt that this is a very conservative appointment uh, that is making a very conservative court. And the court, as I knew it, uh, as I came into this business a generation ago, uh, is very much in jeopardy. Um, Justice Venero, you said smart, honest, diligent, and fair are the things you would look for. And clearly that's a floor. But let's look more candidly, I think, at the ideological mm -hmm. content. You have an administration, the Bush administration, which has campaigned against the current court, or at least about the kind of justices it wants, more vigorously than any since the Nixon administration, which only you and I in this panel are old enough to remember, and has said that it wishes, using code words in politics, to change the court, uh, eliminate activist judges, and in the parlance of the day, politically, that means shift the court politically to the right. So the executive branch has said, we want to change this court and make it look more like Scalia and Thomas, who are the right wing of the court. So clearly there is an ideological component in the executive branch's nomination and in the voting patterns in the Senate. Well, the problem, I think, is there's been too much rhetoric from elected officials on both sides of the spectrum. Yes, you had the president campaign in terms of ideology of what he would like to see on the Supreme Court, but you had his opponent doing the exact same thing, but on the other side of the perspective. And I think that's unfortunate because I think judges should not be labeled with uh, words like conservative or liberal or far left but or far right. it's a political right. appointment process. I mean, the political branches make the appointment, so to expect them to remove politics is probably unrealistic and may not even be what the Constitution contemplates. Well, it is a political process, yes, but I don't think it should be so highly partisan and so highly charged. I wonder, uh, Professor Payne, if you think that the um, Bush administration uh, was thinking 
um, as unpolitically as uh, Justice Venero thinks um, this process ought to be. Seems to me it was a very political appointment, and I wonder if the Democrats in the last two elections uh, were political enough in terms of raising the flag of what could happen if Bush were elected. Well, that flag was certainly raised. Um, it's, it's, it's a hard issue to make salient in the retail level politics of a presidential campaign. Uh, you know, it's part of the package of what you get when uh, you vote in uh, one administration or uh, the other. Um, I certainly agree about uh, the baneful effects of some of the overheated rhetoric, but uh, I think it's a mistake to try to get the politics out of Supreme Court nominations too much. Uh, it is a political process, as Mr. Brown just said. Uh, and uh, the Senate has a role in it precisely to create a balance between the views of the president uh, and the views of the country. Uh, sometimes they align, sometimes they don't. Uh, and as we all know who do this um, law business, uh, uh, the devil is in the details. There, there's always room for interpretation, for, for moving a decision a little bit one way, a little bit the other way. And uh, how one chooses to do that depends on your frame of mind, your ideology, if you will. Justice Videro, let me approach this same problem from a much more specific mm -hmm. point of view. Right to life. Uh, certainly when now Justice Alito was in the Reagan administration, he, while in the executive branch, talked about taking the opportunity to overturn Roe. Uh, certainly the, the right wing that's dominated the Republican Party has made, certainly since Reagan, eliminating Roe one of its principal political criteria. And certainly while um, one wouldn't want this to be elevated too high, what a, man, what a man's mother says about him is important. His mother says he personally opposes it. That is the right uh, that's enshrined in Roe versus Wade. Why would we not be amiss if we didn't see that as a sign, given who he's appointed and what the history is, that this is an appointment at least designed to change the court on a critical and controversial ruling? Because what matters is not a person's political view, but whether that person is going to uh, let that view override other factors and result in judicial decisions. And we just don't know if that's going to happen in Justice Alito's case. And I think he deserves the benefit of the doubt, whatever hard, his political hard or personal views are. Hard as it is to apply left-right political criteria, despite different doctrinal methods, mm -hmm. Justice Scalia and Justice Thomas right. always seem to come out on certain issues, on certain issues relating to criminal justice, civil rights, on the right conservative end of the spectrum, despite all the methodological questions and an obvious honesty. Why doesn't that mean that underlying this are at least some political views and ideologies that are affected and do affect a judge's rulings when they're on the Supreme Court? Well, sometimes Justices Scalia and Thomas are predictable, but sometimes they're not. Uh, one of the most significant decisions that the United States Supreme Court has issued has to deal with sentencing guidelines and whether there's a clear right to a jury trial on factual issues. And Justices Scalia and Thomas surprised a lot of court watchers by consistently voting in favor of defendants' rights in that respect. We just don't know until the case is decided. Although there are other ways one could interpret that, but even if we concede that, because that's another program, because I think Scalia's opinion could be interpreted in a number of different ways. But in fact, by and large, they do tend to have an ideological bent that nobody could say they were confused about and which does affect the rulings on critical decisions not necessarily well, certainly every judge bears his personal his or her personal experiences to, to judicial decision making these aren't robots these are human beings these are persons but the key is whether their personal beliefs are going to dominate judicial decision making in the case of abortion uh, the, the right to choose issue justice Alito when he had an opportunity uh, actually struck down a regulation on abortion. Uh, and that was the case dealing with the partial birth in New Jersey. So I, I think the jury is still out. Hard to imagine, though, Justice, that uh, George Bush would have named these two justices not feeling quite sure that something that's been so important to where, to his vision, uh, wasn't already pretty secure. So I, I want to ask you, Professor, what do you expect now? Um, the pro-choice people have been waving the flag and saying, you know, disaster really is here, asking for funds to fight and saying the fight is upon us. Do you expect that Roe gets toppled, that there's a serious attempt to do so? Well, you know, the most significant thing, I think, that came out of the confirmation hearings was the, the, the very obvious uh, uh, 
refusal um, by now Justice Alito to commit himself to Roe as precedent. Uh, surely that wasn't accidental. Uh, he certainly left himself maneuvering room uh, there. At the very least, I think we can see uh, a cutting back on Roe, a process that the court has been uh, undertaking for years. Uh, I think the marginal calls are going to go against uh, uh, the right of choice. Uh, whether Roe will be formally overruled or not, I, I, I think is a, is a close call. I, I, I'm not sure, uh, but I think, it's a, I think it's a real possibility. John, let me explore another issue which might not be a litmus test issue, but has deep philosophical and political overtones. Uh, the broad expansion of executive power during the war on terror, particularly as it focuses on the warrantless surveillance issue, which is now being heavily debated around the country and in the Congress. Uh, the expectation of many people on both sides is that the Supreme Court is going to have to rule on this issue in some way. Would not the nomination of Justice Alito uh, suggest the nomination of a person who has already expressed pretty strong views on underpinnings of executive power that may very well mean that the Bush administration has kind of picked a court that may rule its way when, say, NSA surveillance mm. reaches it. Well, one has to assume that that's what the president thought he was getting. Um, and if one looks at um, uh, Justice Alito's record, it's harder to look at just, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' record because it's much smaller, but um, you, you certainly see a sympathy uh, of thinking uh, towards executive power. Um, and this is a really big issue. Uh, the Constitution is nothing if it's not checks and balances. And if the court doesn't keep a balance between the, president, pres the presidency and the uh, legislative branches, uh, we're in serious trouble. So. Uh, all of that intelligence and integrity and willingness to put aside personal opinions, I certainly hope comes to the fore uh, on this issue because this is an issue that calls for judicial statesmanship. Reason do you think, Justice, for, um, for alarm on this question that the balance in fact could get out of whack because you've got somebody who was picked in part because of his uh, strong feelings about the executive expressed? I don't know if there's reason for alarm, but here I do agree uh, entirely with Professor that checks and balances are vital to the system. Uh, this is the system that the founders had envisioned. And I would, uh, I would really be uh, disappointed if the United States Supreme Court abdicated its role in that process. You know, that said, even if you were to agree that the court is political or the process is political and that ideolo ideology matters I in the system and selection, you do have to take a step back and say to yourself, well, George Bush did win the election. Uh, it was a national election. It was very clear where he stood on judges. Uh, no one can accuse him of backing away from at least his own vision of a judge. My only point is, uh, once you put on the black robes for life, you could surprise and change, uh, change your uh, expectations. And uh, I have a feeling Justice Alito might do that. I sat through, um, oh, maybe four of the 18 hours of, yeah. uh, of questioning on the confirmation <laughs> hearings of, uh, of Judge Alito. And one of the phrases that we heard again and again from senators um, on the Dem side was imperial presidency, that this was going to be a promotion of the imperial presidency. Again, overstatement, you think? I do. It's an overstatement because you, the, the, I think it, it really belittles the court to suggest at this juncture, without having seen any rulings on this point, uh, that they're going to simply rubber stamp George Bush. I don't think they will. And John, I think one thing up, that okay, John, go ahead. One thing that gives some hope in this area is that the Bush administration has so outrageously overstated the case uh, that uh, it's hard to believe that uh, the court would go along with it. But but let me ask you this question: that um, this justice replaces Justice O'Connor, who was the voice in the Hamdi decision, the decision involving detention, which both sides argue about is either justification or not justification for the wireless, uh, the mm -hmm. warrantless surveillance. And you also have a lot of subtle points that dovetail with your comment about retail politics. Most folks haven't th heard about presidential signing statements, but it's an argument that Justice Alito had championed in an earlier life as a sign that the president could have a bigger role in interpreting legislation. Little things like this that may mean more to lawyers than non-lawyers, do they suggest as a sign that maybe Justice Alito can almost be predictably expected to support the executive branch? 
Well, again, I think the, 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 the little things are easier to accumulate perhaps than the, uh, than the big things. Uh, but the little things take a long time to accumulate. Uh, it, it takes a while usually for precedent to really coalesce into a, a hard line of authority. Uh, and so I would guess that we're probably going to move in the direction of greater respect for uh, executive authority, certainly than one would have uh, found a decade ago, a couple of decades ago. Uh, how far, how fast? Um, I'm not sure. It depends on how the, which, which cases come in which order. Justice Pinero, another specter raised um, on the left has been affirmative action, civil rights, civil liberties, mm -hmm. all of this on the line, um, one would have thought, just from the Alito um, confirmation. and that in fact we now have a Bush court that has a stamp that we're going to see again and again in negative ways. That is the concern, I understand. I still think it's too early to say. Uh, you know, let's do a little math here as well. Uh, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Alito, uh, Justice Scalia, Justice Thomas. Let's assume they all vote as a block. I'm not sure that they will, but let's assume that they vote as a block. That's still one short of a controlling majority. So this idea that Justice Alito is going to swing the court uh, overnight, I, I just don't think that's going to happen. And I think the professor is right as well when he says change at the court at the federal level uh, comes incrementally. Our jurisprudence, our common law does not change overnight, at least in most cases it does not. And there's always room to modify and to modulate the common law. And I think Justice Alito has the great capacity uh, to respect precedent, to apply the facts fairly uh, to the law as he understands it, and uh, I don't think there's anything to really be overly concerned about. How about affirmative action, um, where in fact Justice O'Connor was the swing vote and the author of the, of the decision? We don't think anybody's going to try to overturn Brown uh, v. Board, but the Michigan case, is that not something that could in some way be revisited and affirmative action again seriously on the line? I think by the terms of the, of the court's own opinion, Justice O'Connor's opinion, that is now settled law at least for 25 years. And so I, I don't think the court's going to uh, overturn that precedent at this juncture. Any fear of that, Professor? I certainly hope Justice Venero is right, because this is something, of course, that's central to what we do at the law school. Uh, and, and the court was pretty categorical. But it, this gets, I think, to the, the, the core of the line of uh, discussion we're having here. Uh, the, the hallmark of what uh, Justice O'Connor uh, did, particularly in her later years on the court, uh, was to apply pragmatic common sense to the solution of problems. Uh, her opinions weren't always elegant in terms of sorting out the law and the, the rules, uh, but uh, she grounded them in, in common sense uh, uh, quite often. And that's the antithesis of grounding a decision in an ideology. And I don't use ideology in a bad sense there, in, in having a strong belief in a principle that overrides uh, uh, consequences. So. Um, I think what's essential here on affirmative action uh, questions is that the court adhere to this more pragmatic uh, notion of uh, uh, the fact that race plays a role in our society, that the uh, overcoming of the history of racial discrimination is something that we still have a great deal to do about, and that we can't accomplish that important social goal without um, uh, permissive constitutional rules. Justice, we started this conversation on the premise that we were talking about the Bush court, but in fact, generally we describe courts by the name of the Chief Justice. And I've been looking at some work by uh, the professor and some of his colleagues, which excruciatingly looks at what the Rehnquist court did. And it turns out that, at least in some details, maybe they weren't as dramatic in turning back the tide of the Warren court as people anticipated. Does that mean that this movement is so slow that, A, we'll never talk in the future about the Bush court, and that the Roberts court may not be as dramatic? as a change from the Rehnquist Court, as some might think? It means that. It also means you have to look each issue as an issue and take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, one of the things I think is very interesting is how the, the Rehnquist Court handled the Miranda decision, the decision that says that an accused has to have his rights read to him or her prior to an arrest or during an arrest. Everyone thought that as soon as the Rehnquist Court had the first opportunity, they would overrule Miranda. In fact, the Chief Justice himself, uh, prior to joining the court, had given all those signals that he would do that. Well, what did the court do? Uh, not only did it affirm Miranda, 
but Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote the majority opinion. Of course, he did it basically a stare decisis. I guess we have to end by asking you, John, in 10 seconds, can you tell us, is this going to be a radical breakpoint that we'll look back on in the future as having marked the change in the court? Ask me back in 2008, and I'll tell you. <laughs> I uh, guess we'll have to do it's, that. It's, gonna take, it's, it's a gonna, conversation to be continued, I it's guess, it's in 2008, another, not before. But for now, that's it for this edition of Due Process. Our thanks to former Justice Peter Venero and Professor John Payne, and to you for watching. Until next week, for Sandy King and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Please join us again on Due Process. Samuel A. Alito, Jr., do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Look, Sam Alito may be a scholar and a gentleman, but I think his elevation to the Supreme Court is a constitutional disaster. I think we are heading back not just to the pre-Warren Court, I think we're heading back to 1936 in the pre roosevelt Court. I am proud that the hard work and sacrifices of my parents and grandparents enabled my brother to achieve the American dream far beyond what any of them could have imagined. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, a private foundation focusing on New Jersey public policy issues. Additional funding provided by Lawyer's Diary and Manual, and online legal reference, elaw.com.